Good morning. I'm Wade Riles, the pastor here at East Brent Baptist Church. I'm so thankful that you have dropped out to watch this video. We are so thankful to be able to produce this for you. Here at East Brent, we believe that God has called us to be faithful to the Great Commission. We encapsulate that with a little slogan that just says, get right, get in, get out. Our prayer is that you are right with the Lord, involved in a local church and out serving King Jesus. Before I let you go, I want to encourage you of the importance of being a part of a local church. Technology is great and watching sermons are wonderful, but they are not being a part of a local fellowship. If you don't have a local fellowship and you are living here in the Pensacola area, we'd love for you to visit. We meet every Sunday at 1030 here at 4801 North Davis. If you do have a local church, then I would encourage you, be involved, be faithful, be committed. I thank you so much that you've dropped out to watch this video, and I hope that it blesses your heart. Have a great day. Good evening again. Hopefully you're awake. That's good. Let's see it. There we go. Now, let me preface something. If, if we were in the worship center when it's fixed, and y'all pray hard because that needs to happen quickly, one of the things that we're doing over there is that we're going to have a place that's very set aside and designated for preaching. I would not be standing at that pulpit tonight doing this because I am not preaching. I want to give clarity there. There is a distinction and a difference between what we're doing tonight and, and when a pastor says open up the Bible and turn to and preaches. That may mean nothing to you, but it means a lot to me. There is a distinction and there is a difference. What we're doing tonight is discipleship driven. It's educational. But, but I am not opening the text and saying, thus saith the Lord. That being covered, we are talking about being uncompromisingly Baptist. Last week, we looked at and we gave a very, very, very short synopsis and historical timeline of everything that happened from the time of the Reformation up until the early 1600s when we start seeing talk of these folks called the Pilgrims. Now, tonight what we're going to do is take a step back because in that very wide address, I didn't give due diligence to three very critical characters that are part of the Reformation. You and I are here tonight as Protestants in many ways because of what these three guys did. But if you'll notice that I titled this Men or Myths. As Baptists, there are three ways that we've traced or three arguments in different ways of tracing our heritage. There is an argument that says that there's been a succession of Baptist churches all the way from the time of Jesus. I disagree with that. I think that it's, it sounds good. It even preaches well, but it lacks a whole lot of historical evidence. Now, if you were to say there has been a true church, a real church, from the time of Jesus until today, then I'd say absolutely. But to be able to say that it's been a Baptist church in the way that we understand it, well, the problem is, is that, that there's really no historical evidence for that. And then on top of that, what does it mean to be a Baptist in the first place? And we're going to talk more about that. But the second view says that we have our roots in Anabaptism. I'm going to show tonight that there are a lot of overlap with some of the doctrines that were presented by the Anabaptists, but there's also some very significant differences. The third view, which is the view that I hold, and, and you would find most of your conservative scholarship holds today, is that it's really almost impossible to say that there's one origin. It's kind of like saying, where does the Mississippi River begin? The reality of it is, is that, well, you could say that it starts at Lake Atasca in Minnesota, but the reality is, well, what about the streams that 
feed into Lake Itasca. The reality is, is that, well, there's a whole lot that feeds into the Mississippi that makes it what it is. And that same thing is true for us as Baptists. But tonight, what I want to do is that I want to show some problems to begin with that we have to avoid when we're talking about the Reformers. The first one is hero worship. I can't tell you the number of guys when I was in seminary that thought that some of these Reformers were after Jesus and maybe Paul that these reformers were the greatest things that ever existed. We have to be careful that we don't hero worship any of these guys. They were used mightily by the Lord. God did some incredible things in them and through them, but they were severely flawed. And it's important for us to remember that, that they were not super special, but rather they were men that God used. Well, the flip side to hero worship is we also need to be careful that we don't villainize them. There's probably very few that have been villainized in the same way that John Calvin has been villainized in many cultures. We have to be careful that we don't hero worship on one side and that we don't villainize on the other. The third thing is that we have to be careful with historical telescoping. Now, let me explain this to you. Historical telescoping is for us to take the standards and the ideas of today and transfer them back to their day and then expect them to live up to the same standards that we have within our day. That's unfair. We see that happen all the time with historical characters, and it's often used so that you can discredit them, or the word that will be used today is cancel. Historical telescoping is unfair and shouldn't be done. The fourth thing we have to be careful of is historical revisioning. It's important for us to know that there was real history that happened, and the facts and the events of real history that happened are important. But just because we may disagree with an individual doesn't give us the right to revise the history in which the individual lived and what the individual did. That's poor history. Now, we're living within a day in which historical revisionism is becoming normal. It's even accepted within academia. But it's poor history, and it will not allow us to arrive at truth. The fifth thing that we have to avoid is a lack of context. Tonight, I'm going to talk a lot about context. Because in order to understand some of the things that Luther said, you have to put yourself within the context of where Luther lived and what Luther was dealing with. In order to understand the situation of Ulrich Zwingli, you have to understand the distinction that Zwingli had versus Luther. In order to understand John Calvin, you have to understand how he was educated, how he was trained, how he came from France to Switzerland, how he left Switzerland and went to Strasbourg, and how he came back to Switzerland, and all of the events that played a part in that. Context is going to allow us to understand circumstance. What I want to do now is I want to spend just a minute and tell you what I believe the greatest gift that the Reformation gave us. We're all familiar with the five solas. I believe that the greatest gift that the Reformation gave us is actually one in, in, in which we use every day and don't think about. And it's what's known as the historical, grammatical approach to interpretation. Out of curiosity, how many of you have ever heard that word before? Historical, grammatical approach to interpretation. Awesome. Let me read this to you. In 1515, Martin Luther, he rejected the elaborate fourfold Hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is a, it's a big word that means science of interpretation. He rejected it. Now, this had become prominent throughout the medieval cultures, and it led to some really far-fetched ideas. It left scriptural interpretation in the hands of the experts, who alone were capable of figuring out all of the secret things that the Bible passages really meant. It would eventually lead to the great Protestant Reformation which is therefore most fundamental, fundamentally, it's a hermeneutically driven structure. You say, well, what is the fourfold method? I know that you can't read that. I can't read that. So I'm going to read what's off of my screen here. The fourfold method, this is how medieval priests, 
how they would go about attempting to interpret the text. The first is called the narrative sense. The narrative sense is you try to read the text in its original narrative form. The second is called the allegorical. The allegorical, well, this one gets interesting. In addition to knowing about what actually happened, now you say, well, the Bible goes deeper, and there's something there that's there in story form. So take, for instance, like the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a physical physical dwelling, but it's actually also symbolic of God's tabernacling presence in the person of Jesus. Now, let me stop there. You said, well, that doesn't sound bad. But you have to be careful because just because it doesn't sound bad doesn't mean that it's rooted in Scripture. And so they would use this as a form of interpretation. The third one, probably never heard this, tropological. This is the ethical sense. Every single text has to have some moral that it's teaching so for instance take David and Goliath who's your Goliath and what stones are you going to use to take down your Goliath sounds good doesn't it might even preach terrible interpretation terrible hermeneutics the fourth one is what they call the anagogical or the eschatological, big words here, just simply means that every text has got to be pointing forward to something else. Here's the problem with all four of these. I'm going to simplify it. And it can be simplified in the use of a preposition. If I use the term exegesis, that's a big word that simply means that the truth comes out of the text. So ultimately, the responsibility of the preacher is to see what does the text, what does it present to me? Eisegesis, on the other hand, ice is in. It presents and puts the truth into the text. The problem with the form and the interpretation that was being used during the medieval period is that it didn't start with the authors of Scripture and flow out from the authors of Scripture, it started with the interpreter, and they used their ideas, and they put them back into the text. Let me give it a way that everybody will understand. Don't you know that the Constitution is a living Constitution? I mean, you've heard that before within the culture that we live in. That's the idea. On the other hand, is what came out of the Reformation, which is the historical grammatical approach. Let me read this to you, and then we're going to talk more about it. According to Luther, and I would argue he was right, according to the earliest of our church fathers, each Bible passage has one meaning. It is rooted in history, and it's related accurately to the common principles of human language. So, when Paul wrote, Paul used language that would have been common to him that the people who would have received it would have understood. When John wrote, John used language that would have been common to him that the people, as the recipients, would have understood. And guess what? Paul was more educated than John. So therefore, when we look at Paul's writings, we would anticipate a much more educated form of Greek than we would when we look at John's writing. So, the next thing that it says is, is that it also relates real, interconnected, historical events that must be acknowledged and understood before the various teachings of the Bible could make sense or have application. And grammatical means that the language is the way that any normal person would use it. So, grammatical historical hermeneutic is absolutely vital because it tethers the truth of the Scriptures to real historical events that have an impact on our life, and it gives us a way to study the Scriptures with confidence according to well-established dictates of human language. Now, those are really nerdy words to simply say this. When I take this Bible and I open this Bible, let's just play this little game. We're going to open this Bible, and we're going to go. Somebody tell me where to stop. All right, so we're in John. Imagine how that works that I said somebody tell me to stop after I have my finger right there. One of those preacher tricks. 
Somebody tell me about John's background. Who was he? What was his background? He was a fisherman. Now, are we able to go back and construct what a normal life of a fisherman would have looked like at around the time of Jesus? We sure we would have. Are there any things that we know about John's background? Does he give us anything outside of being a fisherman? Does John give us anything? He's got a brother. Interesting. Does he give us anything else? Follow John. Well, that's, that's, that's an important little thing here. Why is John different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Matthew, Mark, and Luke seem to follow. They're almost in this parallel with each other. John's different. Why might that be? He's younger. What else do we know about John? For instance, Matthew, Mark, Luke, when did they die? Easy to say before John, right? When did John die? We're talking mid-90s. John lived until he died. Typical, normal, at a typical normal age. Now notice that none of the things that we've talked about are actually interpreting the Bible. All of the things that we've talked about, though, play a role in interpreting the Bible. Now, when we take John and we look at some of the things that John says, let's, let's just go back. And John starts in a unique way, doesn't he? In the beginning. Wait a minute. Have we ever heard anything like that before? Where have we heard something like that before? Wait a minute. So you're telling me now that all the way in Genesis, there's a beginning of a book, and now in John, it begins the same way. Do you think that that might be for a reason? Do you think maybe there's some, or is this just accidental? Now, if we were to take this, what language was John written in? It was written in Greek. Now, here's the great part. The beauty of the historical grammatical approach is that every single one of you can do every single thing that I do to prepare to preach. There is nothing that I do that is outside the norms of what anybody would have the capability of doing. You could go learn Greek. You could go learn biblical background. You could go learn hermeneutics. You could take the commentaries and see what this person says, see what this person says, see what this person says. You could put it into a form. You could put it into a sermon. The historical grammatical approach, what it does is it understands that it is not the reader that determines truth. It is the original author who had something very clearly on his mind that he articulated, and that truth is found in its original context. It is found in the author, in his original intent. Now, let me tell you why this is so important. And this transforms, number one, the way that the Bible is studied. It's going to transform the way that the Bible is preached. And guess what else it's going to do? It's going to transform an entire nation. And it's going to have a huge impact because guess what? Not too long after the fact, there's going to be some folks that are going to leave and they're going to come over here and they're going to start a nation and they're going to get tired of being taxed without representation. So they're going to go and they're going to sit down and they are going to say, we aren't doing this anymore. Now, here's the thing to remember. They were not rebels. They were not revolutionaries. Our founder said, hey, king, you're not doing what you said you would do. So that means that we have the right to declare our independence. And they sat down and they declared their independence. And a little later, they give us this wonderful thing called the Constitution. Now, here's why this is so important. 
Do you realize that right now, why those three Supreme Court justices that Trump nominated are so vital? Because we are very fortunate right now that we have on the Supreme Court, I'm not going to say they all are originalists, and some of them are like Roberts or partial originalists, but at least he's partial. But what we have on the Supreme Court are people that see that truth is not found in how it's received, but truth is found in the original intent of the author that wrote it. Guess where this has as its origins? Now, I'm not going to say that it originated in the Reformation. I'm going to say that it came back with a vengeance during the time of the Reformation. If someone, oftentimes when I pe talk, people talk to me about the Reformation, they jump up and down and say, what do you think the most important thing of the Reformation is? And they'll say, it's because we're not Catholic. And I'm like, yeah, that's good. Go get a tattoo, and that's, you can be cool. Here's what I would say to that, though. I would say that as a legacy, the historical grammatical approach to interpreting the Bible is vital in understanding why the Reformation has had lasting power, why it has sustained, because it completely transformed the church, and in many ways, it transformed the West. Now, we talked about this last week. What issues led up to the Reformation? There was corruption in the church. I'm going to talk a lot about corruption in the church as we go forward. Number two, there was a beginnings of a push for there to be purity within the church. There are people that are saying, okay, the Bible says we ought to do this, and well, you're not. Number three, I put here big words, Renaissance scholarship, ad fontes. This, if you take the historical grammatical approach, this would be the train that takes you there. Because what you see within this Renaissance scholarship is they said, I don't care what a living scholar has to say. I want to know what the sources say. By the way, let me, uh, let me give an uncompromising and unabashed push for classical education. One, one of the big reasons I believe in classical education is because I don't want my kids reading what somebody else says they said. I want them to read what they actually say, original sources. Renaissance scholarship pushed us back to that. Number four, we begin to see a push for the Bible to be translated into the language of the people. Well, that's going to change things because if you didn't know Latin, well, you weren't going to understand what was being done in a mass. Now you are able to understand. The fifth thing, there's growing nationalism. Nationalism didn't just begin. You're going to see how that plays itself out here in just a few moments, and then the printing press. Now let's talk about Martin Luther. And I'm going to fast forward. I'm going to talk a lot about their life really quick. But German priest, 95 Thesis. How many of you heard 95 Thesis? And how many of you have often attributed the 95 Thesis to an act of rebellion? It is not. As a matter of fact, the 95 Thesis is Martin Luther doing his job. Martin Luther was a priest. Martin Luther was a trained priest. He was a scholar. He had a Ph.D. at this point. He was very educated. Martin Luther saw a problem that had arisen. This fellow by the name of Tetzel was pushing indulgences. Now, indulgences were already accepted, but here's what Tetzel's done. He's, he's put it into a form that has made an indulgence a commodity. So let's just say, for instance, let's just say that you want to go out and really sin big tonight Come drop 100 right here, and you can go do it. I'll stamp it with the Pope's approval. You pay your indulgence, all is well. Luther sees how this is being completely taken advantage of. And so the majority of the 95 Thesis, it is written because what he does when he nails the 95 Thesis up is he's calling for a debate. He's calling for a conversation. He's calling out the problems that he sees. And he then wants there to be reform, wants there to be change. Originally, Martin Luther was not anti-Pope. As a matter of fact, originally, when he put the 95 Thesis up, Martin Luther was not anti-church. But here's the problem. The people in power, well, the ones that were receiving the money because you wanted to go sin, they felt challenged. And so they began to push back. They interpreted what Luther did as a challenge. So Luther said, you know what? I was an anti-pope, now I am. And he changes his mind on that a little bit later. He realizes, yeah, I don't like the pope anymore. He's bad. He's probably the Antichrist. 
That'll get you in trouble as a Catholic. Now, they eventually, let me fast forward. They excommunicate him, but here's the problem. You still have the Holy Roman Empire. Charles V is the Holy Roman Emperor. The Pope excommunicates him, but Charles V has said, no one can be excommunicated unless there has been a proper trial. The church doesn't want there to be a proper trial because they've already excommunicated him, but Charles V says it's got to happen. So they put it together, and we have the Diet of Worms, or worms if you're a redneck. And so what they do next is they bring him in there. Now here's the promise. The promise was that Charles V said, I will give you security all the way here, and I'll give you security no matter what happens when you leave. Now here's the problem with that. Emperors were known to lie. Uh, as a matter of fact, go back and I think the John Huss, about a hundred years before that, didn't work out so well for him, and he was given some of the, the, the same protections. But he was promised that I'll give you security here, and I'll give you security there. Now, here's what they did to him. They said that the, the meeting's going to happen at 4. When he gets there at 4, they say, no, it's not going to happen until 6. And they finally bring him in there, and it's a charade. The whole thing's a charade. Every bit of it is a charade. And they're like, okay, he's gone. And I read this last week. I'm not going to read the, the, the whole thing again. But the great part is at the end, he says, I stand convicted by the scriptures to which I have appealed, and my conscience is taken captive by God's word. I cannot, I will not recant anything. For to act against our conscience is neither safe for us nor open to us. Here I stand. God help me. And he walked out. Now, life is about to get interesting for Martin Luther. After the Diet of Worms, he begins to, well, be unabashed in his speeches. Let me, let me give you an understanding of Martin Luther. And I can't believe I'm going to say this, but the parallels are there. Martin Luther and Donald Trump would have gotten along well. I'll just, just put it to you like that. There is nothing that, that Luther wouldn't say. Luther was known for always having an insult in his pocket. And literally, Luther would walk around and would come up with ways to tease the Pope. How many of you love to sing that song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God? Okay, you know who he's talking about there when he gets towards the end and he starts talking about the evil one that opposes. That's the Pope. That was who he was focused towards. Now, but here's the problem. This is going to be a problem for Calvin a little later. One of the things when you become a firebrand and you become a leader is that what you say and what you teach can be misinterpreted or reinterpreted by other people. And what you actually meant can be expanded and changed. When Martin Luther was writing with Erasmus, and I always get it confused. He wrote freedom of the will, right? Bondage. Which one wrote the freedom? Bondage. All right. Luther wrote bondage. Erasmus wrote freedom. They're arguing with each other. One of the things that Luther wrote is that when God saves us, we are set free. Well, in Germany, if you were a landowner, well, you were the boss. If you weren't a landowner, you were a peasant. Some of the peasants picked up Luther's writings and said, hey, wait a minute, we've been exploited, we've been taken advantage of, and guess what? Just like Luther said, we've been set free from bondage, we've been set free from captivity, and they used it, and they said, hey, we're not going to take it anymore. And guess what? This fellow by the name of Thomas Muntzer comes along. And he comes along and he says, let's not take it anymore, let's revolt. So they have the peasants' war. It didn't work out so well. Munzer let them in, and they went in with their farm equipment against a fortified and heavily, heavily advanced military, and 6,000 of them died. Well, the cow back to Luther, and Luther was very, very clear that he did not agree with what the peasants were doing. But it shows you, because I want you to understand that at the time of the Reformation, it was a tender box that was ready to explode. And so anything that was said got used, and it got exploited, and oftentimes got manipulated. 
But Luther, at this time, was single because he was a priest. Now, there was a group of nuns who had heard Luther preach. One of the things that he's remembered for is that Luther had a massive personality. And Luther was just that guy that when he walked in became the center of attention. He had attracted the attention of these nuns. Now, the story is, whether you believe it or not, the story is that they wrote to Luther and said, hey, we want to come out and we want to follow you in the Reformation. And so Luther, he puts together a, a plan to help them escape the nunnery. And the story is, or the legend is, is it true? Who knows? But the story is it, it preaches well. The story is that they put together a group of fish barrels. And they go in supposedly bringing fish into the nunnery. And they take fish out, and they put nuns in. And supposedly the nuns rode out of the nunnery in the fish barrels. But it doesn't stop there, because here's the problem. If you were a nun, and you chose during this day not to be a nun anymore, you had, well, two good options. One, your family would be willing to take you back. Number two, you get married. The third option, well, is not a good option because then you have to figure out how to survive on your own. And in their day, we'll just say not a good option, okay? Leave it at that. So he brought out these nuns. He was able to get every single one of the nuns married except one now before you begin to think that well she must have been ugly that's not it that is not no that's not it's just the opposite so what happened is is this girl by the name of Catherine von Bora her parents said no you can't come home and so Luther attempted to find someone for her to marry. And she said, nope, 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 nope. And came down to, she said, I'll marry Luther. Luther had no desire to get married. As a matter of fact, Luther's right-hand man, Melanchthon, didn't want him to get married because he was afraid that if he got married, then that would give fuel to the Pope. Because one of the things that the Pope did to tarnish Luther's reputation is said, he's just somebody who's driven by sexual desires, and all he wants is to get married. It was one of the things that the Pope had thrown out there about Luther. And so here he is, and so he finally says, I'll marry her. Now, when asked the question, why are you going to marry her? Luther gave three answers. Number one, he said, it'll make my dad happy. Because one of the things that his father had said is that I want my name to go forward. He said, it'll make my dad happy. He said, number two, one of the things that Luther believed is that Luther believed that they were in the end times and that the return of Christ was imminent. And one of the things that they taught in that day is that because creation order had gotten turned upside down, that was evidence that the end was about to occur. And so one of the things that Luther said is getting married would be getting creation order right. And so his second argument, it's weird for us to hear that, but his second argument was based off of creation order. But his third argument was the best. He said, I know that if I get married, the Pope will be infuriated. So they scheduled to be married. On the day of his wedding, one of his best friends walked up to Luther and said, Luther, how do you feel about today? He said, I feel nothing, but I hope, I hope that word has made it to the Pope and that he is restless. Now, hold on. I want to tell you something that you're not going to be prepared for. Luther goes into the marriage with Catherine von Bora, literally getting married just because. But what happens next is incredible. 
Luther and Catherine von Bora fall madly in love with each other after they get married. And one of the cool stories is to watch how the relationship evolves. And one of the things that's really interesting is that at the time that this happened, weddings, by and large, happened for two reasons, a dowry or an alliance. One of the things that happens that Luther doesn't get enough credit for is that Luther, in many ways, is the precursor to the Romantics. Because what we see is that Luther and Catherine von Bora were together and they liked each other. Really interesting thing in their day. Something else that becomes very interesting. Little did she know that Catherine von Bora was also going to be the early precursor to the pastor's wife. And in many ways, for the next 100, 150 years, their relationship and the dynamics of that relationship are passed forward, and they were looked at as models for what love and marriage within the clergy should be. Very quickly, I want to get you to Zwingli. Lutheranism is happening in Germany. The reform movement, as we know it, happens in Switzerland. Now, in their day, Switzerland had 13 what they call cantons, which is city-states. This is known, how many of you have heard the name Magisterial Reformation? Have you heard that before? Here's all it means. It means that the Reformation is going to happen down from the magistrates. So what you're going to have is you're not going to have a separation of the church and the city-state. The two things are going to be combined. Zwingli was a master politician. He was incredible. He receives the call to Zurich. But you've got to understand how you received the call. He's a priest at the time. And in their day, what they would have is they would call in a teaching priest. I don't know if they would call it that, but the city-state would bring someone in, and that priest would give guidance and direction. Well, Zwingli is one of two candidates. But something, when they did their background search, came up. When they Googled him, they found out that he had had an affair. And so when the pastor search committee sat down with him, they asked him and they said, have you had an illicit affair? And Zwingli said, yes. Now you say, how did he get the job? Because the other guy had also had an affair with multiple mistresses and he had six children outside of marriage. So Zwingli was the lesser of two evils, I guess you could say. Zwingli was known, and he gave to us something that you receive almost every Sunday. It's called Lexia Continua. You know what that means? It means take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 1. Next week, take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 2. The next week, take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 3. It was Zwingli that introduced this. And he drew massive crowds to hear it. Now, Zwingli had a close friend by the name of Conrad Grable. Conrad Grable took Zwingli's ideas. Now, here's what Zwingli's ideas were. We only do it and believe it if the Bible teaches it. Well, Grable comes up with this crazy, harebrained idea. He says, Zwingli, infant baptism's not taught in Scripture. Why do we do that? Now, remember what I told you about Zwingli being a master politician? This is a problem. Now, backtrack, I want you to understand about infant baptism in the day. When we think of infant baptism, because we live in an era, in a culture, where there's a separation of the church and the state, we only think of baptism in regards to how it impacts the individual in the church. And yes, that was true. So baptism was entrance into the church. But in their day... Baptism was also entrance into being a citizen of the state. And so one of the things that happened is is that if you did away with infant baptism, they called it treason because you did not allow the individual the right to become a citizen. So what happened? He said, Grable, 
did I put it in there? Nope, but I'll finish the story. Grable, don't do it. Grable said, for real? Grable goes and gets his buddies, George Blaurock and Felix Manns. They go out in the river right in front of the city, and they commence to baptizing each other. And they're kicked out of the city immediately after that. Now, Felix Manns would come back two years later, and they executed him. So that didn't work out for him either. Zwingli and Luther, they need to have a meeting. Now, you need to understand why they need to have a meeting. Because in Germany, Lutheran. Switzerland is a mixed bag at this point because in Switzerland, what you've got is that you, you've got some of these 13 city-states that are holding on to being Catholic. Many of them are changing their allegiance to become Protestant. Zwingli has already become Protestant. He's left being a priest, and now he's just an adulterer Protestant pastor. And so now what we've got is that we've got Zwingli, and we've got Luther, but what we have is that we have this one political and very key leader in Germany that says, I need the two to come together. And so they have the Marburg Colloquy. Luther didn't want to do it. Luther said, I'm not interested. Luther wrote 15 points and said, if i got to go, these are the 15 points. They agreed on 14.66% or 14.66 of the points. Literally. They agreed on 14 of them. There were three sub-points on the last one, and they agreed on two of the three. But Zwingli said, I do not believe that when we partake of the Lord's Supper that the Lord's Supper actually brings the body and the blood of Jesus with it. Luther said, you heretic, and they leave his enemies. Well, by 1529... Switzerland is becoming extreme. You don't ever think of Switzerland being a volatile area, do you, for civil war? They used to not be neutral. They are divided right now between Catholics and Protestants. Now, here's what Zwingli, the memories of master politician. Zwingli went, and he went to all of the Protestant city-states, and he said, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to buy goods from the Catholic city-states, and we're going to create an economic barrier. Sounds good. He went back to Zurich. He thought very well of himself. What he didn't know is the Catholics said, well, you're going to create an economic barrier, and we're coming to kill you. And they sent a massive army to Zurich. And the story is that Zwingli came out with his sword, and that's a picture of him there with his sword. He came out with his sword fighting. They were outnumbered four to one, and Zwingli died. After he died, all of the Catholics, they took his dead body. They put him in a chair. And when they put him in a chair, they commenced to having a heresy trial, just like they had had for Calvin. And they asked him all of these questions, and this is literally what they did. They said, if you recant, raise your hand. And he didn't. They then cut him into fourths. They quartered him, threw his body into the fire after it had finished burning, mixed it with manure, and threw it out in the field. When word got back to Luther, guess what Luther said? The heretic got what he deserved. Once again, remember, we're not heroes, we're not villains. Let's talk about Calvin for a minute. I'm, a, I'm running way out of time. By 1536, Geneva has declared itself Protestant. A fellow by the name of William Farrell had been there. This is a name that gets overlooked quite often. But Farrell was in Geneva before Calvin. Geneva was from, um, Calvin was from France. Calvin's dad wanted him to go into the priesthood. He studied to be a priesthood. Something happened with his dad, and his dad said, don't do it anymore. Sent him to study law. It was there that he began to learn the thoughts and the ideas of the Reformation. But it was also there where he began to accumulate the tools that would help him throughout the remainder of his life. He was analytical, and he was incredibly intelligent. At 27 years old, Calvin has already written the Institutes. That's his massive work. Now, he's going to expand it, and he's going to translate it into French later. But at this point, he's already written them. He and his younger brother and his younger sister, they're planning to go to Strasbourg. 
On their way to Strasbourg, they run into one of these fights between the Catholics and the Protestants, and he realizes, I don't want to go to Strasbourg. He takes a detour, and he ends up in Geneva. When he ends up in Geneva, he's there for one night, and Pharaoh hears about it. Pharaoh comes to his room and says, we need you to stay and help me reform the city. Calvin said, I don't want to do it. I want to go to Strasbourg. I want to be a scholar. I want to write books. I want to read books, and I don't like people. Pharaoh commences. You can't make this stuff up. Pharaoh commences to pray imprecatory prayers against Calvin. And he says that this is the Lord's will, and if you disobey, he prays that all of Calvin's writings will rot. That his pens will go dry. Ultimately, Calvin agrees to stay. He is there until 1538. Not long, they get expelled. Why did they get expelled? Well, because Calvin started to actually implement some of the things that they were writing. And guess what? There were some really bad sinners in Geneva. And they didn't like the fact that they were being called out and being called on to account for their unholiness. And so they run him out. Calvin's like, yes. And he goes to Strasbourg. A few years later, there's been some things happen, and they call from Geneva and say, Calvin, we need you to come back. He's like, I don't want to go. I'm happy. I don't like people, and I just want to read, and I want to write. But he ends up going back. When he's called back to Geneva in 1541, the next 14 years would be a fight to reform the city. One of the things about Calvin is he's probably the most villainized of all of the reformers. Very quickly, let me get into a couple things. There are some huge contributions that Calvin gives us. Number one, he systematized the reformed thought. So Luther was constantly preaching. He, he was constantly attacking. Zwingli was not really the theologian that Luther and Calvin was. What Calvin does is he takes the ideas of the Reformation, he systematizes them. And we see that in the Institutes of Christian religion. The second thing that he does is that in his commentaries, he solidifies this new approach to interpreting the Bible. So when he writes these commentaries, what he does is he takes the historical grammatical approach, and by writing, he's now teaching everyone who reads these commentaries how to properly interpret the Bible. He's also the first one to put out the Geneva Bible, which was the first, what most of us all have, study Bibles. It, had a, it was a Bible that had notes. The other thing that gets missed about Calvin is his influence stretched throughout Europe, and guess what, as I'm going to show here in just a second, throughout the New World. But there's a couple things that we need to clear up about Calvin, the man versus the myth. How many of you ever heard, Calvin killed Michael Servetus? Anybody ever heard that before? Okay, just me. Good. Let me explain to you what they'll bring you. They'll say that He's a murderer because he killed Michael Servetus. Real fast, let me tell you about who Servetus was. Michael Servetus was a loser who denied the Trinity and who was consistently picking a fight with everybody. The Catholics have already got him in France. They've already put him on trial in France. They've already condemned him to die in France, and he gets out. And he comes to Geneva, and he picks a fight with Calvin. Now, everybody thinks that Calvin was the judge and jury. He was not. Calvin was the, we'll call him, expert witness. Calvin was the one who presented the orthodox view of the Trinity. Michael Servetus says, I don't believe that. The council says, you die. Calvin goes ultimately to Michael Servetus and pleads with him to recant, and he refuses. Calvin then goes to the council and pleads with them. Can you find a more humane way for him to die. They say, we will not. And ultimately, they execute him. The second thing that gets thrown against Calvin is that he was a tyrant in Geneva. He was not. Calvin was quiet. Calvin was antisocial. And Calvin was not very good with real human relationships. He would much rather read a book and write a book than have a conversation with someone. But oftentimes he gets presented in such a way because what he did, though, is that his ideas attracted attention. The third thing, Calvin did not pick tulips. Now, if you don't know what that means, oftentimes when you hear Calvin, you think, oh, he's that tulip guy. No, he's not. Calvin didn't teach the tulip. 
Calvin, Calvin's theology was built upon two things. God is sovereign, and he does all things for his own glory. That was Calvin's theology. Now, what ultimately happens is up in Holland, a fellow by the name of Jacob Arminius says, I don't like some of these thoughts. He writes what's called the remonstrances. But then he dies. And after he dies, some of the people take his remonstrances, and they expand upon them, and then it gets back. And Theodore Beza, who was like Calvin's right-hand man, he responds, but then they have a synod that they call the Synod of Dort. And it's at the Synod of Dort that they respond to all of the things that Jacobus Arminius says. Now, just so that you know, tulips didn't start growing until the late 19th century when someone came up with that idea. It was not a part of Calvin's teaching and it wasn't a part of any of the things that he was dealing with now the last thing is calvin believed in predestination so calvin didn't believe in evangelism that's just dumb it's untrue it's inaccurate and is a poor depiction of reality first off calvin did believe in predestination because the word is in the bible the question is not do you believe in it the question is what do you believe about it the second thing that happened is that calvin is probably history's greatest church planter when the Catholics began to bring persecution against some of the Protestants in France, they fled to Geneva. Calvin said, I've got an idea. Let's go back to France and let's win them to Christ. He sends a group back. They plant five churches. Within five years, those five churches have become over 2,000 churches with over 3 million converts. They're known as the Huguenots. One of those converts is the captain of a ship who makes his way all the way to Brazil where they plant a church. Now, Calvin in Geneva would have people come from England. He would have people come from Holland. He would have people come from Scotland. Guess who John Knox studied under? John Knox made his way ultimately into Geneva, studied under Calvin, went back to England, went back to Scotland, and that's where the Presbyterian church has its birth. So to say that about Calvin, it's just, it's not historically accurate. If you don't believe me, let me show you a couple of Calvin quotes for us to close tonight. And you make up your own mind, not based upon what somebody says, but based upon what he wrote. Calvin said, we pray you now, O most gracious God and merciful Father, for all people everywhere, as it is your will to be acknowledged as the Savior of the whole world, through the redemption wrought by your Son, Jesus Christ, Grant those who are still estranged from the knowledge of him, being in the darkness and captivity of error and ignorance, may be brought by the illumination of your Holy Spirit and the preaching of your gospel to the right way of salvation, which is to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That was a prayer that he taught as a catechism to the people in Geneva. He said this in the gospel of John commentary for he intended expressly to state in John 3 16 that though we appear to have been born to death undoubted deliverance is offered to us by the faith of Christ and therefore that we ought not to fear death which otherwise hangs over us and he has employed the universal term whosoever both to invite all indiscriminately to partake of life and to cut off every excuse from unbelievers such is also the import of the term world, which he formerly used. For though nothing will be found in the world that is worthy of the favor of God, yet he shows himself to be reconciled to the whole world when he invites all men, without exception, to faith in Christ, which is nothing else than an entrance into life. He says on his commentary in Ezekiel, he says, Now all are called to repentance. And the hope of salvation is promised to them when they repent. This is true since God rejects no returning sinner. He pardons all who come to him without exception. I want to finish this. And the reason that I, that, I, that I think it's important for us to emphasize this is so often people hear somebody say something and they immediately believe it without actually checking the sources and without actually reading about it. Now listen, there are some things I don't like about Calvin. I'm not going to baptize a baby. There's a whole lot of things that I disagree with him about. 
But one of the things that we're going to have to do is that if we're going to be intellectually honest is that we have to let people speak for themselves rather than allow people who may mischaracterize them speak and us not fact check and make sure that what they're saying is actually accurate. Now listen, Calvin, lots of flaws, lots of faults. Calvin taught some things that you and I, we would not agree with but some of the things that gets thrown out there about him they're just untrue and just like luther just like zwingli it's important for us to get beyond the idea that they're heroes or that they're villains they're just men fallen men that god used at a very specific time for a very specific purpose and for us the thing that matters is not what do they say what do they teach but rather what does the bible say and what does the bible teach and here's the part that i believe that i can accurately tell you all of the reformers would say that's what we fought for i don't want you to come and ask me what i think i want you to go back to the scriptures and to the sources and say what did they say as a matter of fact we are here today as recipients of the Reformation, and we have the privilege to do just that. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being in your house tonight. Be with us as we go. Give us strength, and Lord, give us grace, and may we bring honor and glory to your kingdom. We pray in Christ's name. Once again, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that God's word has communicated truth to you, and I pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that your life will be changed. If there's anything that we can do or questions that we can answer, please reach out to us. You can email us at info at eSprint.com. We pray that God will work in your life and we pray that you will be blessed immensely. Thank you for stopping by. God bless.